as the race for the president keeps getting bigger, does it get a little bit crazier? Let's check it out. Hi, my little flavors. Welcome to another episode of The Motley Stew Show, where we try to cut through the noise about the biggest political story of the week and try to tell people what's really going on. Cut down to the basics, like who the hell are these people that we're talking about and what really is the story? And of course, why should I care? So let's see if we can do some of that right now. Now, a couple weeks ago, four different people announced their intentions to run for president of the United States. I went over two of those people last week, Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont and former governor of Arkansas, Mike Huckabee. There are some who think of these people as actual contenders, while others think of them as long shots. Now, this week, we're going to take on two more candidates who most people see as long shots. It's really hard to find anyone credible who see these as serious contenders, but contenders they are. Far outside the mainstream of the Republican Party, Dr. Ben Carson and former CEO of Hewlett Packard, Carly Fiorina, are constantly polling in the single digits, if polling at all. Yet, we have a long way to go, and if the 2012 election cycle taught us anything, it is a long and bumpy road, and many things can change. So let's first take a look at Dr. Ben Carson, who sprung onto the political scene back in 2013 during his speech at the National Prayer Breakfast, where he didn't directly criticize Obama or his health care law, but vaguely laid on some pretty heavy smack while Obama was sitting right there. Many people in the political circles found this to be pretty tasteless, but people in the conservative party found this to be awesome and speaking truth to power. They went absolutely nuts, and in no less than 24 hours, people were talking about him as a presidential candidate. A virtual unknown before this actually happened, he's still unknown to many people in the voting world. So let's take a look at some of the things about him. He's a retired pediatric neurosurgeon and a former director of that department at Johns Hopkins University. In 1984, he was only 33 years old when he got the director position, and that made him the youngest doctor in the country to get to that level. In 1987, he led a team of doctors in the first successful separation of twins who were joined at the head. He's also credited with bringing back a procedure called the hemispherectomy, where half of the brain is actually removed in order to cure ailments in the other half. He also has a long, hard road type of backstory, growing up really poor in Detroit with a single mother who couldn't read, so he is not your typical blue blood political elite storyline. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Honor by George Bush for his service in neurosurgery, and he never has held public office in his life, which is actually one of the selling points from his campaign. But as we'll see later, he's not the only person trying to use this tactic. Interestingly enough, he made his initial announcement to run for president by accident, sort of casually letting it go inside of an exclusive interview with local news in Detroit. His actual announcement was supposed to be the next day in Detroit Music Hall. Now, leading up to the point that he actually announced his intention to run for president, he has had many political snafus between the National Prayer Breakfast and now. On CNN's Newsday, he once told Chris Cuomo that being gay was a choice and his proof was the behavior of people in prison. He said, a lot of people who go into prison straight and when they come out, they're gay. He attempted to apologize and backtrack from that statement, but he never wavered from his position that sexual orientation is a choice. In keeping with the gay marriage theme, he also suggested that the federal judges and state judges that are actually overturning the state bans on gay marriage, calling them unconstitutional, he says that those judges could be removed from the bench by Congress, stating that their own actions are unconstitutional which technically they're not. He also called marriage equality a Marxist plot and said that its supporters were enemies of America and like so many people before him, had the gall to compare being gay to pedophilia and bestiality. Once again, he apologized. Now it is kind of funny that he's in the race for 2016 when earlier he said that the race for 2016 might not even happen because Obama may declare martial law and rule out the 2016 election keeping power for himself. His reasons were the growing national debt, ISIS, and the democratically controlled Senate, which of course is no longer democratically controlled, and of course there always was going to be a 2016 election. Now I mentioned this next quote in an earlier episode about war, but let's go back and take a quick look at it. When talking about war, Dr. Carson said this, if you're going to have rules for war, you should just have a rule that says no war. Other than that, we have to win. Now, many people saw this as a tacit denial of the thing called war crimes, which in itself has come up for a number of countries, including America, in the recent strife. Now, back in his early days of fame in 2013, he made this comparison to Obama's new health care law. Obamacare is really, I think, the worst thing that has happened in this nation since slavery. And it is, in a way. 
It is slavery in a way because it is making all of us subservient to the government. And it was never about health care. It was about control. Now, more recently, he's condensed that sentiment and just saying that Obamacare is a bunch of crap. Now, looking to his economic proposals, he supports a flat tax, saying that everyone should pay the same percentage of their income. Whether they're poor or rich, everyone should pay the exact same percentage. And he sets that percent somewhere between 10 and 15. But other economists say to keep the same amount of income coming into the federal government, it would have to be somewhere around 20%, which quickly is pointed out to be a tax deduction, a lowering of the tax rate for extremely rich people, and a skyrocketing tax rate for people who are very poor or actually don't pay taxes at all right now because they're under the poverty line. This flat tax would also close a lot of loopholes and deductions, saying it would make it fairer on the rich side, which it won't do by far, but also on the poor side, some of those people who don't pay taxes actually get a tax credit, which would also be taken away, making it doubly worse for them. Simple, as in simplifying the tax code, in this case just isn't the right way to go. Making himself stand out a little bit in the current slate of Republican candidates, he was the only person to actually visit Baltimore after the riots. It was seen by many in that community as a big step for a Republican, but also they have a very tenuous relationship with him. He lived there for quite a few years, and they saw him as a hero, something that young black men could aspire to be up until around 2013, when he hit the scene with his conservative politics, which quickly wore off his heroic shine in a heavily democratic area. So there you have it. That's a number of things about Dr. Ben Carson, and you can find more on his political website here. Next up, let's talk about former CEO of Hewlett Packard, Carly Fiorina. While she has also not held public office before, she has a slight leg up on Carson because she has run for it. Back in 2010, she ran against Senator Barbara Boxer for her Senate seat in California and lost in a landslide. But people come back from those things all the time, so let's take a look at a few tidbits about her. She ran Hewlett Packard from 1999 to 2005, and when she got that position, she was the first woman in America to actually run a Fortune 20 company. She came in right before the collapse of the dot-com era and the huge recession, but she also directed Hewlett-Packard through its merger with Compaq, which many people on the board of Hewlett-Packard disagreed with, but she overruled them. Now, this is going to be her main asset and her tagline in her campaign, that she has the business experience to understand the economy of this country and how to get it back on track. That being said, when she was ousted from Hewlett-Packard in 2005, the stock for that company was actually trading almost exactly the same as when she took it over. And when the announcement of her dismissal was actually made official, the stock rose 7%. Money does not lie. She is also a cancer survivor. She was diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2009 and had a double mastectomy to rid herself of the disease. She's also touting herself as the only person coming from the tech industry, which is a major industry for a growing economy. But putting her in a solid minority with that industry, she railed heavily against net neutrality and especially against the FCC's decision to use Title II regulations on the internet. She also recently said that the devastating drought in California was a man-made creation, basically brought on by environmentalists who fought against water retention rights. For those leaning to the right side of the culture war debate, she is in lockstep with you. She almost completely opposes abortion, and she personally voted for Prop 8 against gay marriage in California back in 2008. Now, currently and likely the only other woman in the race, she is directing a lot of her attacks against Hillary Clinton, calling Clinton the personification of the professional political class. She also coins herself as the conservative alternative for the female vote. That is assuming that all females who are voting for Hillary Clinton are only voting for her because of her gender. Now, that being said, if the arena can prove that she can hold on to a significant part of the female voting bloc, she might be looked at as a VP pick. But before they do that, they might want to take a look at the positions that she takes on policies that directly affect women. She opposes minimum wage hikes, saying that entry-level workers will find it harder to get jobs. But incidentally, two-thirds of minimum wage and three-quarters of low-wage workers are women, and the hike in that minimum wage would do drastic things to their income. She also agreed with the Supreme Court in their Hobby Lobby decision, saying that businesses have the right to control what contraception and birth control is covered by the insurance of that company. So a corporation's religious beliefs trumps the employee religious beliefs, or lack thereof. She also opposed the Paycheck Fairness Act, which would make it easier for women to find out about gender pay discrimination and actually take action about it. She went on to say that the gender pay gap does exist, but she actually blamed Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party for creating it. She also fell victim to a trap that many GOP candidates seem to be falling into, which is she failed to register carlyfiorina.org, which now hosts a webpage showing one sad face emoticon for each person that she laid off while at Hewlett Packard. There's 30,000 of them. 
Luckily for her, she does actually have CarlyFiorina.com, which redirects to CarlyForPresident.com. For those people that might think that Carly Fiorina does sound a little bit familiar in politics, it might be because she ran the most infamous ad during 2010 when she was trying to get that Senate seat. It was actually against another Republican during the primary battles. For obvious reasons, as I show you this clip right here, it became known as the Demon Sheep ad. So there you have it, the two last people who have currently jumped into the race that we haven't covered already, and now we wait for more. Which brings up the obvious question, do you support either of these two people? Do they have qualities that you like? Do they have qualities you don't like? Let me know in the comments down below. So thanks for watching another episode of The Motley Stew Show. If you liked what you saw, feel free to subscribe right here. You can also like, favorite, and share. All those things are great and they help out the show a lot. Stay tuned till next week. And as always, a little bit of Logan. Bye, buddy. As we will see later, uh, I'm gonna take more till I get a cotton mouth. So thanks for watching another episode of the Motley Stew Show. If you like what you've seen before, I looked over there. I looked over there. So thanks for watching another episode of the Motley Stew Show. If you like what you've seen this time, or seen other episodes in the. Uh, uh, uh.